Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Yourself Healthy podcast. I'm your host, Heather Duranja. Let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everybody. On today's episode of Think Yourself Healthy, we have special guest Beatrice Camus. She is an embodiment coach, astrologer, and host of the Self Love Fix podcast. When she's not on her roller skates, catching a vibe, you can find her helping her clients learn how to shift their energy, their thoughts, and their limiting beliefs so that they can embody their desires and the person they always imagine themselves to be. Beatrice teaches this through self-love and spirituality. Beatrice, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm really curious to hear what, you know, the way, how do you describe, how do you define self-love and spirituality? I feel like these are kind of catchphrases that we're hearing thrown out all over the place now. And um, I'm curious what this means for you. Yeah, great question. And thank you for having me, by the way. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, So with self-love, I really think that it's largely about self-acceptance and self-trust. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the the self-acceptance piece is something I missed mm-hmm. really early on and I still am learning even more every day. I think it's a lifelong thing. Um I I find it to be more about embodying acceptance, which is why I consider myself an embodiment coach. It's like how can you inside of your body experience acceptance Mm -hmm. and how can you rather than reject what you don't like to feel or suppress it how can you welcome it and I think the same with spirituality I think it's it just mirrors that I initially when I learned about spirituality or came into this world I learned I guess it was more about staying away from things that are dark Mm -hmm. or the sides of us, like maybe ego, the egoic sides of us or our shadows, sort of trying to not run away from them, but it, it kind of felt like it. It right. felt like trying to run away from it. Mm-hmm. And I found that the more I welcome it, the more I almost entertain it. And one of my friends says, invite it over for tea, mm-hmm. <laughs> the more I feel the love for myself grows deeper. I love that. That is such a beautiful explanation. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. When you immediately went into self-acceptance and um, really being able to embody, you know, our true being and feel that from a, from a personal perspective, not just in an emotional standpoint, but also physically allowing ourselves to physically feel that is something that I think we have been taught through society to suppress and to, you know, deny. We have these, these pictations of Disney, you know, Disney type of perfect fantasy worlds. And so we strive so hard to curate this idea of perfection and always being happy and joyful and living our best lives. But Mm -hmm. is, is that there is a lot of darkness that comes with that. And, you know, for myself in this healing space over the last couple of years, I've really noticed that, you know, because of this idea that we're supposed to always be healthy and happy and on our healing journey, right? You got to just, it's all smiles all the time. Well, that's not really necessary a true depiction. And so when we're going through this journey and we have those moments where we're being challenged and the shadow, the ego, the dark stuff is starting to surface. Mm -hmm. It really freaks us out, right? And then, Mm -hmm. oh shit, I've done something wrong. Like this must be karma coming to get me. Like, I don't know what just happened, but this isn't what it's supposed to feel like. And so a lot of times this can really um, create a lot of conflict and confusion for individuals where they all of the sudden decide that their healing journey is done, that they're fundamentally flawed. They're going to forever be fucked up, right? Mm-hmm. So how, how as an educator and an embodiment coach, how do you help individuals learn how to embrace these moments and invite them in? 
Yeah. Oh, this is such a good question because a lot of the clients I work with, um, you know, they've been through trauma. Yeah. They've experienced it usually in childhood. And so a lot of it has to do with helping them understand that they themselves, like their bodies are a safe space to welcome um, these different kinds of emotions or experiences in because the tendency is to get either flighty or, you know, suppress these things to reject it. So firstly, what I do is teach them how to connect to their bodies, connecting to their bodies. And, you know, it's, (laughs) it's interesting because the number one thing, like to your point about the karma and the like, oh, it's coming out to get me. Like, what have I done? I, I have heard this phrase. It's like, I fell into my old ways or something. And which is very similar to what I used to hear in church growing up. I don't know if you've ever, if oh, you yeah. grew up in church. Okay. So what I would hear all the time is like, I backslid or mm-hmm. yeah, I, I've went back to my old ways. And that's what I hear a lot of people say with this spirituality stuff. And I'm like, wait, there is no backsliding. There is no, I fell into my old stuff. I always challenge them to ask questions. Like what if how you are right now is completely fine Mm -hmm. in a sense of who would you be if you could look at yourself? Like this is fine. It makes sense that you feel this way as it relates to the context. Mm -hmm. So I always try to invite them to ask questions that are inviting, that invite these wounded parts of themselves back in. Mm -hmm. I I think that a lot of the times when there's the quote unquote backsliding or the falling into your old ways, all that it is, is you're afraid or or you're upset or you're angry or you're feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, are we ever going to escape that as human beings? Like (laughs) we're never going to escape that. If a lion chases after you, are you going to escape however you're going to act Mm -hmm. in that moment? No, it's unconscious. Right. So what if it makes sense? No, I I like that. That's, that's a really great explanation. I, I encourage individuals to recognize the gift that comes from these mm-hmm. moments where we're having our backslide, right? Where we're taking a few steps back, thinking that we're falling back into own like old patterns, old behavioral um, loops. And, yeah. you know, I get excited when I have that moment of awareness where I recognize the panic, the, un- you know, the, the um, insert, the uncertainty is overcoming me. And I'm like, oh shit, what's <laughs> happening here? Where am I going? And then I recognize this is, this is a gift. This is an opportunity. I'm here to have a chance to utilize the skills that I have been learning and, you know, presenting an opportunity where I can take these new tools and respond in a different way than maybe I have in the past and find some way to offer some sort of gratitude and appreciation for what I'm experiencing, knowing that it's happening for me and not happening to me. Yeah. Having the ability to um, surrender that victim mentality and recognize that everything that's happening for us is is truly a gift for what's next. And we don't have to know all the details we just have to you know surrender and accept this this wave right yeah out yeah I love that surrendering to the wave yeah. and I like what you said about it's an opportunity to use the new tools you have because of course I, I wouldn't be um enabling people's behavior or telling them like yeah just kind of sit in this forever rather what it is is it wants to come out whatever it is this part of you that is afraid or scared so why not let it yeah. why not let it because it's not going to be forever it's really not so it's like when you give it the space then it no longer has the power mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I like that. So tell me, you know, earlier you mentioned that you encourage individuals to sit with this feeling when this stuff, you know, comes up. 
and to allow themselves to physically experience it. Yeah. I feel like mo there's a very good percentage of the population that is so disconnected from their physical bodies. They have no clue where to start when it, you know, when it comes to settling into the physical body and being able to recognize what it's trying to tell us. So how do you ease individuals kind of into this practice? What are some tips that you can give them just to reassure and validate them that, you know, they're on the right path, that they're taking the right action steps and initiatives, since this is such truly a really unchartered territory for many. Yeah, it's really unchartered for sure, which is why, you know, it can almost be dangerous if you try to do this head on. Um, because if you, if you don't know how to sit with your feelings, they can consume you actually. Um, which is why, like, I know there are a lot of modes of therapy where they, they sit with you while they do it or with coaching, same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I wouldn't try to do is I wouldn't try to, cause I've done this myself and it, it wasn't good. Um, I wouldn't try to explore the deep feelings alone. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're new to this, what I would do instead is start small, like with, things like noticing how you feel when you eat food. Um, like, are you full or are you hungry? Or do you like the way it tastes? Like becoming aware of how your body is responding to the world around you. Mm -hmm. That's a safe way, I think, is paying attention to how you feel when you're eating or if you're hungry at all before you eat. Uh, you know, when, even when you're listening to music. Mm -hmm. That's how do you, tip. yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Those, no, that's, those are some great tips. I, I like the idea of encouraging one to kind of utilize their senses, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's maybe listening to the music and how does the music make you feel inside your body? Does it make you want to dance? Does yeah. it make you want to cry? You know, it's going to elicit to all kinds of different sensations and potentially even motions, right? I'm one of those individuals where I laugh at myself whenever I'm in the car early in the morning driving somewhere because I am just like, there's yeah. fire ants in my seat. I am just constantly, you know, just going. And I'm thinking, thank God for Bluetooth nowadays. People don't think I'm as crazy as <laughs> they might once have. But um, for me, really moving that energy out of my body as I'm, having all of this excitement about the day's possibilities and what could potentially unfold and setting the intentions for what I want to experience and what I want to exchange. But I love the idea of also connecting with food. Most people um, really are so disconnected from food and the purpose that food is supposed to serve with nourishing us. Most of us are just aimlessly eating to fill a void for, you know, some sort of, um, emotion space feeling that we are deprived and neglected of. So yeah. Like yeah, I agree. I know that that's, that's something that comes up a lot. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm watching TV. So that means I need to eat mm -hmm. or, like it's, or we associate it with certain activities or mindlessly, which I don't think there's anything bad about it. It's just, again, goes back to the thing of, oh, what, what does, what role does food have in our lives? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think that the, the, these are such great examples. Um, so I'm curious, you know, self-love for me is something that was really one of the latter parts of my healing journey. I initially embraced nutrition and exercise and then, you know, leaning more into um, understanding restorative practice and spirituality and all of those things. But for me, the part that I had the most resistance to was that self-love piece. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I thought about self-love and trying to define that and how to engage in it, um, it was really frightening, <laughs> like extremely mm -hmm. frightening. So for all of the individuals out there whom maybe can relate to my story and, you know, have that feeling of hopelessness when it comes to learning how to reconnect to self and embrace self-love, what kind of advice do you have for these individuals? If, 
if acceptance is a essential component of that journey, where do we start? Yeah, that's a really good question. I always say, you know, don't try to make yourself feel something that you don't feel. I have had a couple of clients where they start out saying, you know, this kind of feels like a lie to me right now. They're, they're really honest with me. And they're like, this feels like a lie to me. I don't, in a sense of trying to uh, put into practice what you're telling me, it feels like a lie. And I'm like, thank God you said that. Thank yeah. God. I don't want you to try and say some affirmations that don't even mean anything to you or whatever it is we were discussing. And I'm literally, I literally tell them, well, let's start here. Just keep it coming out. Mm -hmm. Keep saying what it is you, you actually don't like about yourself or you, 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 whatever insecurities you have, just let it come out Mm -hmm. because otherwise, if you're not true to yourself or not true to yourself, but if you're not honest with yourself about how you feel, it is going to get pushed down. And then what's going to happen is it's going to get projected as jealousy or it's going to get, which again, these things aren't bad. It's just different manifestations of what you're not uh, bringing up to the surface. So it might show up as jealousy or it might show up as like explosive anger towards someone else. It's, it's going to show up in a way that doesn't serve you already. Mm -hmm. So why not just be honest? That is what I would say. Be honest about what you think about yourself. That's one. And then two, ask yourself, is it ultimately true? Is what you're saying ultimately true? Mm -hmm. That's a question. I don't, that's the step a lot of us don't take. Yeah. I like that. And one of the, I know for myself in my own journey, one of, you know, (laughs) I've had lots of therapy, you know, I've worked, I've done all the modalities and early on in my journey, one of the recommendations was to lean into positive affirmation. And it was suggested to myself that I should get in front of a mirror and say, you know, certain phrases to myself that contradicted what um, I verbalized about self. And so initially when I would stand in front of the mirror to do this positive affirmation exercise, I would start to allow the flow of this new phrase to come out. But before it would even come out, I would immediately be like, fucking liar, go liar. You know, like, no, I cannot accept this. And so it was very (laughs) defeating, right? It very defeating. And then I was like, fuck, I'm, I'm unfixable. Like there's no hope here. And then I would want to go and engage in some sort of self-sabotaging behavior to validate what I had just experienced as so-called failure. Yeah. So for me, I had to learn ways to interrupt that pattern. I had to find a tangible tool that would allow for me to um, overcome, override that subconscious core belief of not feeling worthy, not feeling deserving, not feeling good enough, smart enough, accepted, whatever it might be. So when you're engaging with clients and you've you know, got a particular person like myself who's really struggling through that positive affirmation work, what are some tricks that, you know, you can um, encourage them to utilize to help stay consistent with the practice instead of just sabotaging and running away? Yeah, that's a really good question. I always ask, well, how do you want to feel? Mm-hmm. How do you want to feel? Because what you're saying, I, I've seen that too many times where it's like, well, I feel horrible about myself. I feel all of these things. I don't like myself. Um, and then the self-sabotaging begins. Mm -hmm. We, as I believe we, as human beings only ever do things out of desire. So if you, if, if you find yourself in that, like, oh, I don't like myself. I hate like X, Y, and Z. And then you go into self-sabotage. You are getting something out of that self-sabotage that is really, you think is serving you. Mm -hmm. And it, it is in some way. And so there might be part of you who like, you're not going to stop. Nothing I say, nothing anybody is going to say is going to make you stop. But if I can get you connected to how you want to feel, you can start to shift um, the actions that follow it because it it always, our actions always come from our, how we feel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I, that's what I do is we talk through 
how is it that you want to feel? Can you dip into your body and think about what do I actually want to feel? I don't think we ask ourselves that. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And then it also leads me to, you know, this question, which is that I feel that subconsciously so many of us are attached to the pain and suffering of being the victim of not good enough of not. So ultimately, right, it is serving a purpose and it's validating the core beliefs of, of what we subconsciously harbor within us that, you know, more often than less was conditioned from something that we experienced early in birth up to early adolescence. And um, we're not even aware that that is what's driving all of the adult behaviors and actions. Mm -hmm. So how does one, how does one even recognize that they are attached to the pain and suffering? How does one have that moment of truth with self. I can remember mine and it wasn't pretty. I can promise you (laughs) that. But how do you encourage individuals to um, go there? So I think, again, it goes back to that thing of desire. If you really, if you really desired differently for your life, even though we have all of these subconscious like beliefs working against us, that desire will carry you through. It's almost like your guiding light. Mm-hmm. So if it's one of those things where it's like, I, I almost feel like it's, it's spontaneous. It's okay. almost like maybe there was something you were searching for or, or you wanted, and then you were open and receptive. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of got led down a certain path. At least that's what it was like for me. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's about what, are you allowing yourself to be open and receptive to things? Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. With that being said, it definitely brings up a thought for me in my own process. And what I ended up recognizing part of my attachment to the pain and suffering that I was defending hardcore without really realizing that that's what I was truly doing and just kept, you know, saying for me in the end, like, oh, when do I catch yeah. it? You know, when, when do I get blah, blah, blah. But ultimately in the end, this attachment to the pain and suffering was very much correlated with the amount of shame and guilt that I harbored from a lifetime of experiences, decades of experiences of not feeling worthy, of not feeling deserving, of not feeling good enough. And Mm -hmm. I had no idea that shame and guilt were at the root of the attachment to this Mm -hmm. pain and suffering. And what it kept me personally from receiving was pleasure from Mm -hmm. receiving any, you know, this is where I was very, very much attached to being the codependent Mm. uh, realizing that the pain, the suffering, the shame, the guilt, these were all of the, the emotions, the underlying feelings that were allowing me to stay stuck in this codependent narcissistic type of relationship cycles. Yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. The shame and the guilt, definitely. It's, it almost, it keeps you, like you said, it it keeps you stuck. Mm -hmm. It's like an incentive. It's almost like an incentive. Like, oh, I, especially if that's what you're used to feeling. I, I look at it as with our energy or with our feelings, there is some set point that we're used to. Mm-hmm. We hang around and we spend a lot of time. Like for me, most of my life, I spent, I spent a lot of time in the um, guilt and the shame, like you mentioned, um, and in self-sacrifice and pain and suffering. Like you said, it's like, I, because I hung around there, anything that was different from that felt off. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you weren't a lot, like you didn't allow yourself to receive pleasure or happiness or anything. Yeah. It's the same deal. Mm -hmm. Where are you hanging around? Yeah. And sorry, I interrupted you. No, no. So what I'm hearing is that ultimately 
all of the choices that we're making are serving a purpose and ultimately we have to really un you know pull back the layers of that onion and ask ourselves in this moment in which i'm experiencing this present moment of life how do i feel is this in alignment with how i want to feel and if not then what choice can i make to move myself into a direction that's going to be more in alignment with how I want to feel. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. It's decision-making. What? It's, it's decision-making. What do you mean? <laughs> I think it's decision-making. That's the one thing with codependency that does not get taught decision-making. Mm -hmm. Like I, I am, um, I have the agency to make decisions. Mm -hmm. that I can stick with something and be certain about it and hang out there. Instead, it's like wavering or um, I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. I'm not sure. So it's like making a decision and then deciding that your actions are just going to follow suit with that. Mm -hmm. I love that. And for me, the day that I had, you know, a lot of clarity in my own journey was the day that I had to make the decision. Had I decided that I had suffered enough pain mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> that would allow for me to say enough is enough, Heather, like you don't deserve to suffer. And the only common denominator here is you in this, wow. suffering, you know, journey. And so for me, it, it did, it boiled down to a choice. It was a decision that I had to make in order to get in alignment with how I wanted to feel and release myself from the attachment to all of the pain and suffering I had experienced for decades up to that point in my life. Wow. So how do we cheer one on to make the decision? Because it really, truly, you know, it almost sounds like uh, an oxymoron, right? Like <laughs> it, it's really just as easy as making a choice, but that's the reality of it. Yeah. And I, and I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it, it's easy for someone who's not used to doing it. Mm -hmm. And also that's where the self-trust element comes in. Mm -hmm. Can you be willing to trust yourself to make the decision? And can you lose the, and this is where I guess like the cheering on comes in. It's like, who would you be if you decided to make a decision and you said, if it goes my way or if it doesn't, it says nothing about me. Mm -hmm. Like if, if things, yeah, if they go exactly according to plan or if I have to reroute, it's fine. And it says nothing about me. Mm -hmm. Like who would you be? What would you do? What would your life look like if that was your belief system? Right. For me, the, the answer to that question in the midst of my pain and suffering was being very much attached to uh, perfection and to trying to control outcomes and, yeah. you know, displaying a lot of like OCD type of um, tendencies in my adult life of trying to control. And so that was, you know, an attempt to try and avoid criticism, to avoid judgment, yeah. to try and play safe and just be in a state of survival. And, you know, as, as you're mentioning, when we're making these decisions um, that aren't easy, right? Like for some, for someone who has never had um, the ability to make a decision and trust that decision fully, this is literally the most life threatening moment yeah. of our lives. <laughs> like, wait, yeah. what the fuck are you talking about here? <laughs> Am I going to survive? I don't know what that looks like. And I can remember for me um, a very specific day where I was forced to make a decision similar to that. And that was when I uh, chose to get, to get divorced and mm. my life on my own. That was a 
real frightening, frightening place to be. But in the end, it was one of the um, hardest, Mm -hmm. you know, best choices that I ever made for myself and not just for myself, but for my children and friends and family in return. So, um, but again, it really is about having to shift our perspective. And, and really change the perspective around what we think we're experiencing, right? Hey guys, I'm going to interrupt this episode for a really brief message and to introduce you to today's amazing podcast sponsors, WaveBlock. If you know me, you know that I am all about reducing toxicity. And to be perfectly honest with you, this whole 5G thing has got me a little freaked out. Did you know that your phone and AirPods emit radiation? According to the CDC, your phone uses radio frequency radiation to transmit its signal. This cloud of radiation just sits outside your brain the entire time you're using your phone or on your AirPods. If you listen to podcasts, talk on your phone, do Zoom calls all day, that exposure really starts to add up. The frequencies from your phone actually pass through your brain, which is really scary and can cause negative effects like headaches, foggy brain, fatigue, and other issues. I love using my WaveBlock EMF protective stickers for my phone and AirPods to direct these harmful frequencies away from my body and my brain. WaveBlock's accredited lab-tested line of products help significantly reduce the amount of radiation you are getting exposed to with their easy-to-apply EMF blocking stickers. They have protection for AirPods, AirPod Pros, and all of the recent iPhone models. These stickers don't interfere with anything, so you can still use your phone case or whatever it is that you like. They just offer all-day protection. Make sure you head to waveblock.com and take advantage of a 20% discount using the code HEATHER. I'll make sure to link it in the show notes for easy access. So make sure you head to waveblock.com to get your 20% off discount and use the code Heather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is. And, and I agree that it it's scary. It's very scary. I think my, for myself too, I was like, what? I, I can't make these decisions. No, I, I just want to play it safe. And also I had to ask myself the way I would motivate myself was to ask can I, how, how would I feel if I continued this way with whatever it is that I had going on? How would I feel? And then it became a thing of, am I betraying myself by doing whatever it is I'm doing? I had to ask questions that got me connected back to my desire. That's the only way we're going to do, to have the motivation to do things. Mm -hmm we have to go first. We have to go first. No one's going to go for us. And it's always a question of how bad do you want something? Mm -hmm. How bad do you want something? Because if you, um, you know, for example, you're maybe codependent and you're in a relationship dynamic that's not serving you. And I know how tough that can be. I've been there myself. So I would never shame someone for it. And also I would say, if, for example, you're someone who's read a couple books, listened to a couple podcasts, whatever, and, and you've heard the things and you know the things, well, then it just becomes a thing of, if you want to be honest with yourself, what, what, are, you, what are you getting out of staying in the situation? There's something mm-hmm. not to victim shame, right? but to actually pose a question that could help you. Like if, if you could be honest about that, if you could be honest about what am I getting out of this, then maybe you wouldn't be running from it. Mm -hmm. And, and, and maybe you wouldn't have as much power over you. Ooh, there's a concept. Yeah. Right. There's a concept. It's, it's amazing how easy it is for us to truly hand our power over. What Mm -hmm. are your thoughts around that? To hand our power over. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of us are not connected to, I guess, I don't want to say how, how powerful we are. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it's like a lot of us don't realize. Yeah. I guess there's another way I was trying to say it, but yeah, it's like a, a lot of us don't realize how powerful we really are. And if we are afraid of that, we actually desire to hand it over. Mm-hmm. And 
I think about this with um, like our traditional jobs, for example, there's nothing wrong with working a traditional job. And also I know there's a lot of people who don't want to, and they'll give all of these reasons as to why they are stuck in it Mm -hmm. and why they can't do something different. And it's like, maybe there's a part of you that actually likes giving, here's, here's my thing. I feel like we secretly love being out of control, Mm -hmm. but there's two ways we can go about this. We like being out of control in some sort of like controlled way. Like, oh, I know I'm out of control, but they're handling it or whatever. It's going to happen this way. Or we like being out of control in surrender, Mm -hmm. like our following our intuition, following our guidance. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. (laughs) Yeah. Like this. Talk yeah. to me more about this. <laughs> this is not a concept. Uh, you know, this isn't a concept that um, is really talked about too much. This this isn't a topic of thought to really kind of dive in and, and examine, wow, what, what could that be like? Yeah. So it's either, it, it, it just goes back to what you're saying about giving our power over. It is the same, it's the two sides of the same coin. Mm. We're releasing our control, but we're doing it from a disempowered state. It's either you're releasing control from an empowered state or a disempowered state. Mm. So then the difference here is one is coming from an act of self-betrayal where the other one is really true, truly embracing self-trust. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. So how do we go from self-betrayal over here to self-trust? How do we make that transition? Because so many of us literally from day one, we've grown up in environments that have really set us up for self-betrayal. Yeah. Um, I, I can just give you some examples as a dietitian and working in, um, you know, the, the food body image type of rule that I see mothers handing down generation after generation after generation. And, you know, we're cultivated in these environments where we're really taught that self betrayal rather than that self trust. So this is a very foreign concept to many of us. Yeah, no, I completely understand it. Is, it is a, a foreign concept. And I, uh, funny enough, I don't know if you knew, but I'm a dietitian too. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I worked as a registered dietitian in, uh, as, as a renal dietitian. Oh my God, no way. Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. So my driving passion to become a dietitian was because of a diagnosis I got um, with IJ nephropathy. And oh, at that time wow. I was 18 years old and doctors told me that I only had five years left to live, that I was oh, either going to be on dialysis or transplant. And at that time, they told me that there was nothing I could do to change my outcomes, that lifestyle was not going to have any kind of impact on what my fate was. But this was the first time in my life where I had an opportunity to trust my intuition and listen to that inner voice that said to me, that doesn't have to be your truth, Heather. And so for me, that's really where my passion for knowledge and research began And as I started learning about lifestyle and habits and incorporating change, the depression and the anxiety and the gut issues that I had been plagued with as early as 11 years old started to dissipate. And then all of a sudden the chronic fatigue that I had been, you know, I thought was just an allergic reaction to having to be in church. Um, that this was actually something that was very much associated with, you know, my diet and my, my, my environment. And so um, I am happy to report to you, my friend, that I have bought 29 quality years on my life from that day in 1994. That's amazing. I only had five years. Um, But here's the thing. When I went into the program to become a registered dietitian, 
I knew that majority of what I was going to be taught was a lot of bullshit that was keeping us stuck, that was keeping mm -hmm. us sick. And so for me, the motivation was really being able to jump through all of the hoops so that I would have the ability to take the board so that I could qualify and um, become a licensed registered dietitian and then practice medical nutrition therapy based off of the evidence that I believed in and yeah. help to support my own, you know, health and wellness. So oh, that's amazing. crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. That's amazing. Though. That's an amazing story. Wow. Incredible. Yeah, so I'm very passionate about what I do. But again, you know, that was the beginning of my journey. Mm. I had no idea that it was going to start with food and exercise and learning how to nourish the body to it really having to be a, a matter of tying in the mind, the body, the soul and the spirit in order to come into this place of wholeness and mm. be able to really, um, harness and cultivate that pure joy and, and energy and blessing that we have. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. I love that now you're able to tie in all of those aspects because yeah, they, they all are related to each other 100%. Yeah. And I, I think in what you explained, you hit the nail on the head with the, the whole, how do we shift into self-trust mm -hmm. if, we as a society are used to relinquishing our um, own power. So you were talking about following your intuition yeah. and how like essentially doctors, the world, everybody's telling you this one thing and you're like, but no, this is how it's, it gets to be. This is how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And then you got exactly the outcome you were looking for. <laughs> that is in a nutshell what it's all about. Yeah. It, it is about, can you be willing to listen? Cause we all have an intuition. It's, it's guiding all of us. Mm -hmm. We though have decided to bypass it and go for what it is other people are saying. And that goes back to our feelings. What do you feel like? What, what do you, is that resonating with you? For example, if you desire to work for yourself, or own a business, but you are working for someone else, how does it feel mm -hmm. to work for someone else? And are you being honest about how it feels? So on point, my friend, I mean, this is bomb advice listeners for, for <laughs> anyone, especially for someone like you and I, who were in the clinical world and decided to shift out of that clinical world. I know for myself, that was some of the most miserable times I have ever spent in my entire life. Anyone who's ever walked into a dialysis center or any kind of like, you know, cardiovascular diabetes type of center, um, the mood in there is pretty low. Energetically, it's pretty yeah. depressing, right? I mean, everything about it. And for me, I was lying to myself saying that I could continue to do this with a smile on my face and my heart busted wide open to help everyone. I was lying, like, no, my heart was getting closed, you know, tighter and tighter day after day with all of the disappointment of seeing what was happening um, in our conventional web, you know, Western practice yeah. model. It's, it was very um, exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have the courage to say, I think that the whole reason I went into this was to teach people what I was able to overcome. And pretty much all of it defies the conventional Western model. So why am I telling myself this story that this is the only place I can be effective, that this is the yeah. only place I can have an impact mm. and giving myself the, uh, the trust to say, girlfriend, you're going to figure this out. Just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> like, nothing can be more miserable than having to show up for this every day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the funny thing of it was with my last job, I loved it. I, I will agree it was difficult. Just working in dialysis was difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I loved the patients, but I felt the same way about, um, I know this is not the only place I can utilize my gifts. That's exactly what I thought. And I had to ask myself, what do I desire more mm -hmm. or most? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just, I couldn't agree more with being honest about that. 
Yeah. And I love this because the reality is, is that most of us are walking around so miserable because we, we do have these gifts, right? We have these Mm -hmm. amazing gifts, but we're not utilizing them in the way that we were meant to, in order to fulfill a purpose and experience that fulfillment of self journey. Right. Instead, we accept other people's stories of who and what we're supposed to be. And then we set that as our baseline standard. And then we seek chasing after these things that were truly never ours to begin with. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I agree 100%. It's, it's like, I had, I had a moment with myself where I was like, why did I go down this route in the first place? What exactly? I mean, I got to where I wanted to get to, but did I actually want this? Or is it that the, the path was, you know, something that was laid out as an option? And so I picked it. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel you so much on that. Yeah. So exciting. So then you make this transition into self-love and embodiment. What a beautiful, you know, what a beautiful gift you are utilizing and sharing with others. So I want to know, tell me one of your most favorite success stories after trusting yourself, making this pivot from diet, renal dietitian into this arena of really helping others learn how to embody self-love. Tell me one of your favorite stories of, you know, um, validation and and knowing that you're in your place. You have found your niche and you are doing what you are always meant to be doing. Oh, that's a good one. Like one one of the client stories or any story, just any story where it really validated and defined for you that that trust that you allowed yourself to have came to full fruition. Yeah. Ooh, that is, oh my God. I feel like there's, there's now I'm like looking through, like in my mind, looking the hard at drive, the right? Story. The flash drive is the yeah. Rolex is going, but then there's, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Oh, there's so many, you know what? I think I could tell a particular story, but I think that there's this pattern that I see with many clients that like, every time it just like breaks my heart open every time, which is I, I watch them go from, you know, even like when we have our, our group zoom calls, like having the camera off, never speaking to showing their face and speaking up about how they feel. Um, but like the hallmark thing I see with so many of them is they go from this thing of feeling shame of, I know I'm supposed to feel this, or I know I I should be here right now to just, this is where I am. This is what I'm experiencing and not hiding it, Mm -hmm. telling me, telling other people, sharing in our groups, because I think about myself and how I learned growing up Mm -hmm. to hide everything, like to hide every single thing that you feel, to not share it. And that's wherever the shame is and if you try to hide it you can't um self-actualize actually Mm -hmm. to this thing we're talking about the gifts that we have and sharing them you actually can't get there because part of that is the acceptance a big part of that is the acceptance and being willing to speak up about things because if you are it's very likely you're going to i don't know you're going to get connected with who you truly are Mm -hmm. so that that to me is, I mean, like up there, really up there. I love it. So what I'm hearing you say is that in order to get to that place of self-acceptance, there has to be a level of transparency and vulnerability that one must choose to embrace and not judge, let go of that attachment to the judgment and the criticism that we have that are deeply rooted in the shame and guilt that have cultivated us up to that point of keeping this skeleton in the closet, right? You know, I don't know about you, but I know for myself that part of my podcast, one of the most beautiful gifts of having this podcast have, has uh, been a platform, an outlet 
to let my skeletons out, to have oh, wow. those moments of vulnerability and transparency. And as I have the ability to share my truths, no matter how, you know, embarrassing, how whatever the label is that we, we might want to put on it based off of what society has depicted, when I let those out of the bag, when those are out into the open, there's an immense amount of healing that happens for me. It's in, it's the surrender. Yeah. It's the accepting. This is who I was. It doesn't define who I am now and who I am, you know, going to continue to grow in. This was a defining moment in my life that allowed me an opportunity to learn a lesson and embrace a lesson and either keep falling victim to the pattern of that lesson or being able to overcome it and move forward in a way that is more in alignment with how I want to feel. Such great advice. I mean, such fabulous, fabulous advice. So what kind of fun things are you working on these days, my friend? Yeah, so... I currently am running a program called self-love over codependency. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I teach like the foundations of self-trust. Um, we're just about to finish it up in the first week of December. Um, but in early 2022, February, 2022, I'm going to be releasing a dating program. I haven't said the name yet. <laughs> I haven't announced the name yet, but it's really about that foundation of self-trust because you know dating is really where all of your stuff comes out <laughs> like all of your stuff it Do can I get, know. yeah it can end up getting it's it's almost like it's serious it's agonizing it's you know it's everything but what it should be which is fun and light and easy right I yeah. just I myself was just married a few weeks ago. And oh, so, amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. And so this is something that has been very near and dear and very much in my awareness over the last many months with um, allowing myself to, you know, receive the relationship mm -hmm. first and foremost. And, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, I'll just share with you and the listeners something that worked for me that I should say has been very helpful for me early on, um, in between the last relationship. And when this relationship began, I had to be honest with myself and recognize that I was the, com you know, the common denominator in these narcissistic codependent mm -hmm. cycles that I was having and that there was some responsibility on my part that needed yeah. to be assumed. And so for me, it was really sitting down and being quiet with myself and recognizing what were my fears? Yeah. What were these things that creeped in that caused me to typically behave in some certain way that I was not necessarily proud of but it did serve a purpose. And typically it served the purpose of self-sabotaging the relationship so that I could be the victim in the end saying, poor me, look, once yeah. I bled my heart and soul out and here I am being left abandoned and rejected once more. Yeah. Ultimately, so I wrote what I considered an owner's manual so that moving forward with relationships, I would give someone an opportunity to see what the dirty laundry looks like, what those skeletons in the closet actually are. So I put together this list of all of the fears, the things, and then the triggers, right? And then how I typically respond. And in order to overcome these things and continue my healing journey, here is what I was going to need a partner to do in return so that I would keep this journey moving forward without making them feel responsible for having to heal me. So pretty early on into the relationship, we hit a little bump where I was in some old behavioral patterns of running, <laughs> you know, kind of going in with one foot and then taking two feet backwards and just, uh, go, you know, having that typical push pull type of, of dynamic. And he called me out on it. And so that's when I decided, oh, I think it's time I better, uh, 
pull out the dirty laundry, you know, open up the closet with all of the skeletons and really get this out there so that this individual can make informed consent decision on whether or not this is something that they wanted to put energy and effort into and knowing exactly how I needed to be supported in order for me to keep moving forward and healing. And so I did that and it was very, very scary, scary moment where I was like, oh my God, what did I just do? Like now they're going to think I'm basket case. They're going to think I'm a lunatic. Like, oh my God, this chick's got issues. But in the end, um, you know, we came together a few days, needed time to digest and, and make sense of all of this information. And then um, he came back to me and said, you know, I, I think this is something that I'm in for, like I can do this. And it was really a pivotal moment for me with allowing self-trust to come in, you know, really yeah. embracing, I made the right decision by sharing, by being vulnerable, by being transparent. And now we have an opportunity to respond to these challenges in yeah. a different way than we have in the past. And it was, you know, for me, it was the best decision I've made and, over the last several months of moving into this whole idea of getting married, it was scary. It was very scary. And my brain was trying to trick me into old things. And I had to just keep re-talking myself. It says who, where's the evidence, you know, in, in challenging those questions. Um, but it, it's, you know, so beautiful and I'm so grateful. So I love that you're taking this information and you're really shifting it into this idea of, what I would like to call conscious dating, you know, really being able to consciously show up for others and be honest with ourselves and um, hold that space and support one another. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's amazing. The vulnerability and being willing to look at your shadows. Yeah, that's exactly what we're going to explore too. It's like- That's so exciting. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, for all of this, so do you work with both males and females or do you specifically only work with females? I work specifically with women. Um, I know some men have uh, either listened to my podcast or they have enrolled in my courses, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but most of them, yeah, it's, it's women usually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. So you're going to be releasing this new program in February, and then the dating app is separate from this, correct? Or I, I, maybe I made an assumption. The dating something is separate. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. The dating program is in, that's for February. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So right in time for Valentine's Day, what a beautiful gift to give ourselves. The, <laughs> the, the gift of self-love, right? Oh, yeah. Because Ultimately, I know for myself and those listening that I had to love myself. And if I couldn't love myself and accept all of those dark, you know, um, shadow ego pieces of me, I would never be in a position where I would be able to receive the love from someone else mm. and give them the love in return that they are also worthy and deserving of. So I believe strongly that self-love is a core component of this journey it starts with self-forgiveness. It starts with self-acceptance. Um, what, what are three tips that you can leave the listeners, um, for anyone who is having that moment of honesty with themselves and are like, it's time to get started. <laughs> yeah, this is good. I would say one, be honest with yourself. That's like the, the best thing you can do. Be honest with yourself about what you feel as opposed to being like, I should feel this way, or it wasn't that big of a deal, or uh, yeah, just be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I would start with that. The second thing I would do is I would start to look towards spending more focus and attention on yourself. This is like where that classic self-love, I guess, advice comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually think there is a a very real place for that for the if you have your own routine or if you want to start your own it's not but here's the catch don't do it for the sake of doing it like 
you know, throwing some Epsom salt in some, in a bath water, I mean, a, a bathtub, because like, you know, you think it's luxurious and, and what you need to be doing. No, really be intentional about what does my body need from me right now? How can I serve it? So servitude, I would say the second one is servitude to your own body. Mm. Um, and the third one is, can you be willing to sit with yourself? Mm. Just without distractions. And an Epsom salt bath is a perfect opportunity for that, right? <laughs> it's a good way to start. It's a good way to start. Just in silence, just be in silence. Try silence. Yeah, that's a scary place. <laughs> it, it totally is. And try it for like two minutes, five minutes, something bearable to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh, Beatrice, such phenomenal, phenomenal advice. You've really dropped some bombs today. I absolutely love all of the tips. And I'm very excited to hear how this dating program is going to pan out. Um, I will definitely be staying tuned to the journey for that. And hopefully you'll share some of that on your social media. So where can the audience find you? Yeah, so you can find me over at my website, which is BeatriceKamau.com, K-A-M-A-U. Um, you can also find me over on Instagram at the self love fix or over on my podcast, the self love fix podcast. I love it. And we will make sure to note all of that in the show notes. So it makes it easy for individuals to find you. I truly appreciate you being with us today and sharing your journey and your expertise and some of your favorite tips and tricks on how you get your clients living their best life. So thank you so much for all of that and sending you all of the love with the new program release. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. I had an amazing time. This was great. So much fun. Thanks for joining us on the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. Make sure you leave a review and let me know what you think. I love reading your feedback. Come hang out with me on Instagram at Heather Duranja. And don't forget to take a screenshot that you're listening to the podcast and tag me. I love to share it. See you on the next episode.